Uh, this morning, uh, President Su mentioned uh, that he was very much inspired. Oh. Okay. This morning, President Su mentioned that uh, he was very much inspired uh, by the news of parity uh, violation in 1957 and its impact on the Chinese community worldwide. So I would like to add to that uh, by saying that I remember very clearly that my father came home uh, one day to say that uh, the newspaper uh, had just reported that two Chinese had uh, overthrown Einstein. <laughs> Since I only vaguely, at that time, you know, I was uh, quite young at the time, and I vaguely knew who Einstein was, but I sort of vaguely felt this was very important and that I should study physics. Um, now, since this is a celebratory uh, occasion, I would like to show a, a few photos of Professor Yang uh, from my private collection, uh, which had never been shown before in public. Uh, but instead of uh, bunching them at the beginning of the talk or the end of the talk, I'll insert them randomly. Um, Let's see, how does this work? Oh, here, I guess. So I would like to start uh, by letting Professor Yang speak for himself. So Professor Yang has written that he first had this idea as a student and that he kept coming back to, to it year after year. And he said that most such ideas are eventually discarded or shelved, but some persist and may become obsessions. So occasionally obsession does finally turn out to be something good. So at Santa Barbara, when I teach students, I always tell them to have obsessions. <laughs> so here's a picture from my collection. And in case you don't recognize the people in it, uh, there's Zi, Yang, Zhao, and uh, Chan. And they're all in the, uh, uh, in the audience. Uh, but time has uh, done its work. <laughs> So in case the young people uh, do not recognize who these people are. Right, they are, they are of course right there. Yeah, they are of course right there. Um, so I would like to start by talking about the unreasonable effectiveness of notation in theoretical physics uh, to paraphrase Eugene Wigner. We all know that uh, notation is very important. For example, the Einstein repeated summation convention, the Dirac, Brown, Kett, et cetera. And so at the most pedestrian level, uh, just hiding indices is a good thing to do. So this is the introduction of differential forms. So, and good notation we know often backed by good mathematics. So in, um, at the time of Yang Mills, 1954, we will write the gauge potential as a mu a. And of course, Yang and Mills' greatest con great contribution is to add the index a. But now we can hide the two indices by introducing a matrix one form. So the challenge in 1954 for Yang and Mills was that given the transformation property of a, uh, how would you construct the field strength? Now, in the modern language, uh, you ask given the one form a, uh, how do you construct a two form that transform correctly? And the answer is almost immediate because there are only two, two, two forms. One is dA and the other a squared. So you can only add them. Now, the chern simons theory in higher dimension differential geometry, we all know, uh, has played an enormous role in modern physics. And I refer in particular to a paper uh, that I wrote with Zumino and Yongxi Wu, who is also here in the audience. So the nth churn character, uh, big omega, is just a trace of the Yang Mills field strength to the nth power. And it is necessary to introduce here a STR, which stands for a symmetric trace. And since the D of big omega is equal to zero, together with the Poincaré lemma, this immediately imply that capital omega is equal to d of little omega. So the question is, how do you solve this equation for little omega? And that was, of course, solved by uh, Chern and Simons. So 
the, in the, perhaps uh, a more modern way of doing things, or a physicist way of doing things, or at least I learned this from Yong Shi Wu, is to make an arbitrary variation of both sides, and then later specialize to A goes into TA, and then integrating over T, where T is a real variable. And you obtain this integral representation for the Chen Simon's form. And the familiar case is just for n equal to 2. Okay? But obviously, for large n, this is uh, going to be very complicated. And even more involved expressions for the non abelian anomalies would be very difficult to derive using the indices notation that was used in the paper of Yang and Mills. So I said I was going to insert some uh, uh, pictures randomly that I found on my, uh, at home. And too bad Kirsten Wang is not around. Um, so uh, I'm sorry I don't remember who this person is, but that's Li, Zi, Huang, and Yang. And already from this picture, uh, we can see that one of the lessons you should draw from this lesson, uh, sorry, from this picture, one of the lessons you should draw, is Professor Yang is truly an exceptional physicist because you see that he is the only one who was not required to carry a cup in his hand. <laughs> so, um, my next mention of Yang Mills theory is a paper that Frank Wilczek and I wrote in 1984, in which we pointed out that the non abelian gauge structure will arise very naturally. In fact, any quantum system with degenerate states evolving adiabatically would exhibit this gauge structure exactly as Yang and Mills said it would 30 years earlier in 1954. Now, um, as of um, May of this year, I just looked it up, uh, this paper has uh, quite a few citations and 73 in 2014 alone. But the significant point is not the number of citations, but the variety of fields uh, and almost none of the citations are in particle physics. And this shows how important Yang Mills is, not just for particle physics, uh, but for all areas of physics. So I'd like to point out the universality of non-abelian gauge structure. Of course, I don't expect you to read. Uh, let's see, is the, uh, this is the arrow. Of course, I didn't expect you to read all these words. But what I just want to point out is the different areas of physics. So look at the terms here, ultra-cold atoms optical lattices, and inversion symmetric topological uh, insulators, uh, quantum dots and single molecule magnets, okay? So quantum gates, geometric quantum gates, and uh, a Yang-Baxter equation and so on. So in all these different areas, non-abelian gate structure uh, comes in. So uh, I'd like to also mention them Three years after I wrote the paper of Wilczek, uh, I had the idea that uh, this could also be seen, uh, yang mill structure could be seen in nuclear quadrupole resonance experiments. So the abstract of the paper said that the abelian um, um, has been, the abelian phase of experimentally observed, but the phases to be observed in various non-abelian experiments are computed. So of course the experiments were done, and the result was exactly as predicted by Yang and Mills in 1954. And the proposed experiments are exactly the analogs of what Yang and Mills had in mind. So here I will show Yang and Mills' paper. So their physical motivation, and I could like to ask Professor Yang afterwards uh, whether they actually had this in mind, was they say that differentiation between a neutron and proton is purely arbitrary. As usually conceived, it's subject to one limitation, which is that once you choose what to call a proton and what a neutron at one location in space and time, then you're not free to make any choices at other space time. And they said that this is not consistent with the localized field concept, and then they explore the possibility of uh, generalizing this. Okay, so this, in fact, um, this paragraph, if you like, was precisely realized in this nuclear quadrupole resonance experiment that I'm going to describe. Um, I couldn't resist, since I Googled the, uh, the paper of Yang Mills, I couldn't resist also them, since it's right, just one click, uh, 
to look up the citation history. In the year 1954 to 1958, there were a total of nine citations. And it was very interesting because two of them are by my friend Sid Bloodman. And Sid Bloodman, in case you don't know, was actually the first one to write down SU2 cross U1. Not Glashow, not uh, uh, Schwinger. But unfortunately, his paper is wrong. It contains a group theoretic error. So, too bad. Uh, one citation is by Lian Yang. But interestingly, four citations are by Japanese authors. And I put an exclamation point. So, of course, I have very limited data here. But it suggested to me that perhaps Japanese physicists are more receptive to new ideas than anyone else. <laughs> because besides Li and Yang, no Chinese physicist bothered to uh, work on this uh, paper at all. Now, of course, in the next four years, 1958 to 62, then there were 60 citations. And the rest is, of course, what they call uh, history, which I won't go into. Now, talking about history, uh, recently, Glashow came to visit Santa Barbara for the first time in his career, actually. And I was chatting with him about that period, of course, which was much before my time. And he mentioned that I should look at this paper he wrote with Gelman in 61, in which they talk about generalized Yang Mills theory associated with simple Lie algebra, because they had a very strict uh, interpretation that Yang Mills was associated with SU2, but that they're going to generalize it to Lie algebra. Now, just to show the young people, the students in the back, uh, what the level of physics, theoretical physics was at the time, what the level of mathematical sophistication. In this paper, they have to explain what a Lie algebra was, what SU3 was, SU4, and so on. Okay, Nobody knew these things. And then it, I, I actually read this paper probably the first one in many, many years, in 40 years. And they actually listed all the algebras, SU2, uh, SU3, the symplectic 2, G2, and so on, SU4. <coughs> and you see that they end with SO9. And then notice this sentence. It is hard to imagine that any higher Lie algebras would be of physical interest. But as almost everybody here knows, Georgia and Glashow's grand unified theory is based on SO10. It is just the next group that Glashow listed, and it stopped there. So he had no explanation. I tried to ask him why he stopped. <laughs> so. Now, Professor Yang has always emphasized the, gauge, the connection of the gauge concept with geometry. And ever since I was a young student, uh, I have taken this. Uh, quite seriously. So, oh, I'm sorry, I'm still taught, I, I forgot. This glass shot was a total digression. I, I wanted to come back to this uh, physical picture that Yang and Mills had about moving a proton and neutron and how that was realized in the nuclear quadruple, quadruple resonance. So I said in their original discussion of non abelian gauge structure, so this is the conclusion of my paper. Uh, Yang and Mills spoke of the degeneracy of the proton neutron. And they imagine transporting a proton from one point in the universe to another. That a proton at one point can be interpreted as a neutron another in an isospin invariant world. It, that's what requires the introduction of non-abelian gauge potential. And my concluding sentence was that we find it amusing that this discussion can now be realized analogously in the lab. And so the idea of the experiments that you have in the nuclear quadrupole uh, there, is two, there are two states. So one we call the proton and one the neutron, and we make an excursion. But we're not making the excursion in space-time. We're making the excursion in, in parameter space. Okay? And when it comes back, it should precisely have the non-abelian uh, gauge structure. And it so happens that this paragraph I copied um, was next to the Acknowledgement, so I also include the acknowledgement, of course, uh, Professor Wu, from whom I learned a great deal, uh, is here. And I see that I thank various people like Strominger and then Wilczek for encouraging uh, me to publish this paper. I was not going to publish this paper. I thought it was uh, almost a trivial remark that the original idea of Yang and Mills could be realized experimentally. But 
this uh, is of interest because it said that I benefited from conversation with Pines and Tickle. And these are two are experimentalists, if you don't recognize their name. And Alex Pines is at Berkeley. And these are the people who did the experiment. And of course, it agrees completely. OK, so the next thing I was going to say was that Professor Yang has always talked about the connection uh, between gauge concept and geometry. And of course, in my career, I've come across this many, many times. We uh, talk about non-abelian gauge theory in particle physics. That's obvious, and so on and so forth, standard model, et cetera. But here's a perhaps unusual connection, which is a work that uh, Shagan Wen and I did uh, in 1992, uh, after he uh, left us for MIT, um, we noticed the following uh, fact, which is quite in, uh, was something that was already known since the 1930s. And I'm sure Prof Professor Yang could correct me on this, but I think it was noticed by Fierce, uh early on that in the in the, on a plane, the number of if you have magnetic flux quanta. Uh, N5 magnetic flux quanta going through the plane, and Ne as the number of electrons moving around, then the two numbers are simply related by this uh, fact where nu is, by definition, the filling, num the filling factor. But on the other hand, on a topological manifold, a closed topological manifold such as a sphere, this relation is shifted by a number. Uh, this cannot be realized with integers, okay? It has to be shifted by a certain quantity, uh, S. And this quantity tells you about topology. And if you're doing this on a, um, so on a Riemannian manifold with genus, other kind of genus, the shift uh, would be a different number. And this is independent uh, of N phi and Ne. Of course, for an actual uh, macroscopic sample in the thermodynamic limit, this is irrelevant. So this is only of mathematical and theoretical interest. Uh, um, in actual experiment, of course, both of these numbers are essentially uh, infinity. So um, this suggests that the quantum Hall fluid state actually couples to the curvature of the space. And in order to include such a coupling, we recognize that on a curved manifold, there's another one form besides the uh, gauge potential one form. There is the connection one form, which is a curvature, so to which we couple a conserved current. And then you go through two lines of arithmetic, just literally two lines of trivial arithmetic, uh, diagonalizing a two by two matrix, you obtain a formula for the shift. Now, you may think that this is just a theoretical mathematical uh, game that have no relevance. But in fact, this paper has had some influence in the condensed matter literature. And in fact, just recently, there's a paper by Fratkin and several Russians. This was published in Physical Review uh, this year. And Fratkin was in Santa Barbara, and he uh, told me about it. If he didn't tell me about it, I wouldn't know, um, since I've long left this field. Um, so people are worried about uh, framing anomaly and such things, and I guess uh, I understand that tomorrow you will hear more about framing. And the framing anomaly of the quantum transcendence term, this is from the abstract of their paper, not from our paper, is essential to obtain uh, this correct gravitational linear response function. So in the lowest order in the gradients, the linear response must include uh, transcendence when z and the gravitational transcendence term. So this is amusing that uh, many years later, uh, this is still uh, part of the uh, condensed matter uh, theoretical physics community's consciousness. OK, so I would like to uh, conclude shortly uh, by just mentioning that Yang Mill's theory still holds many, many mysteries. I personally believe that we are only at the beginning of understanding Yang Mill's theory. Okay? Much yet has to be understood. I'll merely mention two examples which I regard as the most important and probably the most profound. There's increasing evidence that Einstein gravity, the Einstein theory of gravity, just Yang Mill's theory is squared. I put a question mark because this is, of course, not proven. Now, again, uh, the relevant person, Henry Tai, is in the audience. 
So this was first suggested by Kawai, Luen, and Tai in string theory. But in recently, just in the last uh, six months, there have been tremendous progress and tremendous excitement. Uh, and for example, uh, if you're interested in this, you should look at the recent paper by Montero et al. In particular, O'Connell was in Santa Barbara recently. So this is a very exciting development. Uh, the second example I'd like to mention of the application of the Young-Mills theory is, um, uh, involves my own work. So if I may, uh, I will mention very briefly what I've done recently. So um, I think it is time for particle physics to go beyond the Higgs mechanism. The Higgs mechanism is some old thing that we've been uh, batting at for the last 40, 50 years. And it's a completely weak coupling phenomenon. And our condensed matter colleagues have gone far beyond. Uh, they have discovered many new fascinating phenomena. So one question that we raised is whether we could have fermion masses without giving mass to the gauge bosons. And I'll tell you why this is important. So uh, if, that's, if this is the case, we'll give masses to fermions without gauge, giving mass to gauge bosons then we may be able to solve the family problem of an SO18 gauge theory, which was proposed by Gelman, uh, Ramon et al., and by Wilczek and I, and also by Fujimoto, whom I do not know, back in 1980. And the observation is very simple uh, from basic group theory. In basic group theory, uh, the tensor representations decompose not repetitively, but spinners decompose repetitively. Okay, I see David Gross nodding his head. Spinners decompose into a bunch of spinners. This is very suggestive of the family structure. Why nature repeat itself three times? And the spinners repeat themselves. So uh, this was particularly pointed out by, uh, at least this was particularly emphasized, as far as I know, by Wilczek and I uh, in 1980. And uh, the simplest model that has enough room for three families, SO18. But SO18, unfortunately, and this goes again back to Li and Yang, uh, to parity violation, because it's vector-like. And again, David is nodding his head, so I know I'm not talking nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, he's no longer my boss. He's, he was my former boss. <laughs> so, um, now this was inspired by Kitaev and Wen and many others. Wen meaning uh, Shagang Wen, Kitaev is of course uh, uh, this, um, at Santa Barbara we tried to hire Kitaev, he came for one year and then he uh, moved to uh, Caltech. But Kitaev have proposed some condensed matter models in which it's possible to give mass to fermions without giving mass to gauge bosons. And so uh, uh, Bentoff, who was my former student, and who is now going to go work for Kitaev, uh, and I just recently put out a paper. So if this is true, uh, we can in fact try to get, uh, explain the uh, family structure using yang Mills theory. Okay, so I would like to uh, close with a couple uh, photos. In particular, my next one is a truly historic uh, photo uh, that I took uh, almost 40 years ago. And I hope that because I've never shown this in public, perhaps Professor Yang is seeing it for the first time. Now, Unfortunately, Kirsten Huang is not here. I should explain uh, that this photo was engineered and arranged by Kirsten Huang. And my role as a young guy was simply to follow orders. Now, Kirsten Huang told me to bring my camera and, and show up at such a, such a time. There will be a historic meeting, and I should quickly take some pictures. So this, I'm not in this picture because I was taking the photos. <laughs> so here it is. So in case you don't recognize the people, it's Yang, Wang, Wang, Li, and Li. So not all of them are with us uh, today, unfortunately. And um, so the next picture, uh, I also like to fast forward. I like to fast forward uh, almost 40 years uh, later. And this is at Professor Yang's 90th birthday, uh, 40 years from that picture. And the pictures and the people in this are Z, Yang, Yang, and Z. <laughs> So, a birthday, we're here for a birthday for a theory, uh, happy 60. <laughs>
if this were a birthday for a person, I think it would be dishonest to say I will be here for another 60 years, as uh, the Jewish saying goes. Okay? Uh, when people turn 60 in Jewish culture, you always say you wish for another 60. But Yang Mill theory will for sure endure far beyond another 60 years. And quite likely, if I'm optimistic, for at least another 600, if not much more. Thank you very much. Question for the floor. Very interesting talk. Yes. I think that you, you mentioned about the uh, Japanese physicist who was interested from the first day. And I, I remember Sakuraya because was very enthusiastically. Yes. Yes, uh, but Sakurai was not one of the Japanese physicists uh, who, who cited Yang Mills within the first four years. But in 1960, Sakurai was uh, very active, and it was really a pity that Sakurai died so young. Uh, I'm also very grateful to Sakurai because Sakurai tried to offer me a job early in my career. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I, I think Professor Yang could probably uh, remember some of these historical stuff. But when Glashow visited Santa Barbara recently, uh, he did say that Sakurai, uh, the role that Sakurai play. But of course, Sakurai was uh, talking about the wrong gauge bosons. Uh, he was talking about uh, the rho and the omega and so on and so forth. But uh, lives were different for weeks, strong interaction. I mean. Yes, yes, yes. And if you look at these paper of glass shells, uh, he definitely refers to Sakurai. Yes, Professor Yang. about uh, the two problems that you mentioned that uh, uh, has to be solved. Uh, let me tell you a story. I was uh, recently asked by a graduate student, uh, if you were 20 years old again today, what problem would you tackle? I said, uh, I will try to understand Donaldson's theory why four dimension is uh, different from every other dimension. You know, this is very interesting uh, remark because in this uh, Kitaev uh, theory, of course the original Kitaev chain, which made him very famous, as everyone here knows, is in one plus one dimension. But in Kitaev's work, three plus one is very special. And the other thing that makes that I find extremely appealing sort of for somebody who's sort of interested in a little bit of mathematics is that SO8 also plays a very important role. And SO8 especially. And we all know that for people who study group theory, SO8 is perhaps the most beautiful Lie algebra. And this is what we, why we also exploit the SO18 theory and how the three family structure comes about. Thank you. Any more questions? I think we're running out of time. So the Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.